Uh, my name is Dan Stipa. I serve as the Associate Director of Alumni Programs and along um, with our team uh, who put this program together, we're so thrilled to have all of you here. Uh, this is a record crowd. We're just shy of 150. Um, so that means at lunch it's going to be very cozy in the commons area. So you're going to make a lot of friends, so there won't really be many open seats. So just wanted to put that out there now. Um, so then that way you don't, uh, there aren't a lot of like empty seats in between. So um, it's a great pleasure to have all of you here. We have a really dynamic lineup of speakers today that we hope that you will enjoy hearing from. Um, but this program wouldn't be possible without the partnership with the Suzanne Ann Glasscock School of Continuing Studies. And so the Association of Rice Alumni is proud to co-host this program with the Continuing Studies School each spring semester. So if we can give the Glasscock School a round of applause for their support of this program. And in addition, I want to introduce and welcome Marta Golden, who is the Assistant Vice President of Alumni Relations. Um, so she'll be here throughout the morning sessions. And so Marta, thank you for your support and being here today as well. And so without further ado, um, a gentleman who needs no real introduction for so many of us here today, um, Dr. John Bowles, who serves as a William P. Hobby Professor of History, is such a great supporter and proponent of lifelong learning, alumni education, the Traveling Owls program. And so with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Bowles up here to give our opening uh, remarks and talk this morning. So Dr. Bowles. Thanks, Dan. Good to see such a crowd on a Saturday morning. Uh, luckily, uh, when Dan asked me to speak, he uh, gave me some bullet points. These are the kind of things you might say. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so that that, that uh, eases my concerns. Uh, I, I want to uh, repeat what he said, to welcome you to the Rice Campus if you haven't been to this auditorium, to welcome you to this beautiful auditorium. Uh, thank you for giving up a Saturday morning to learn. This, I was getting ready to come this morning and I remember the time over 50 years ago when I was a graduate student at the University of Virginia. And I was there getting a PhD in history and there was another Rice student there getting a PhD in history. And there was a student, a classmate of mine from Rice who had been a mathematics major at Rice but was getting a PhD in English at University of Virginia. And the library had a huge reading room that opened on Saturday mornings at eight o'clock. And one, uh, of course we were all eager students. And one Saturday morning, I remember I got up early and went down to the library so I could get my preferred seat. And I went downstairs to this great reading room and there were two other people waiting to go in. The other two Rice students <laughs> and I thought, there are 17,000 students here, and there are three people this morning ready to go in the library. I don't know if that says something good or bad about Rice, but it was, it was kind of shocking. Uh, so I, I remember that this morning. Uh, it's really interesting to think back how education at Rice has changed over the last 55 years or so. Uh, when I was a student here, Education consisted really of lectures, uh, seminars if you were in the humanities or social sciences, and laboratory work. Uh, we didn't have classrooms that were equipped to show slides or PowerPoint. There were no uh, internet connections obviously in the classrooms. Uh, There's almost no music instruction at Rice then. There was one person who taught a choral class in the basement room of Hammond Hall. Uh, there were two psychology professors. There was no political science department. There was one very prominent lawyer in town, Hank Husbeth, who donated this room, taught one class a year in sort of civics, and that was political science. Uh, there was one part-time sociologist who, when he wasn't being a sociologist, was director of admissions. <laughs> and. Uh, and now I look at this, the, I mean now there are PhD programs in anthropology and psychology and sociology and there's a wonderful music school and the, every classroom is fixed up with a podium with all kinds of electronic equipment and uh, it's just an amazingly different experience and people I think, 
I mean, I thought I got a good education when I went here, but I really do think that students get a significantly better education here. It's bigger, it's more diverse, there's so many more opportunities. And what strikes me is the more rice grows and the more rice changes, somehow the more rice-like it seems. I mean, still, smart students and smart faculty and a beautiful campus and a kind of a culture of learning. So uh, I remember as you know, the kind of an East Texas boy who had never been to a city, never eaten in a restaurant, uh, never been anywhere. Uh, our senior field trip was to Tyler, Texas. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's pretty bottom of the barrel. Uh, I remember just walking along the Roth campus as a freshman and seeing the architecture, and it felt, felt like almost European to me. And he overhearing conversation between faculty and grad students in French and German and Spanish and Chinese, and I just felt like, huh, what, a, what an opportunity. And the place is, again, it was, I thought, a good place then. It's a wonderful place now. And if you're a Rice alum, uh, you have a lot to be proud about and uh, really appreciate the place now. I think it's really important that, and I think this most Rice alums share this idea, to understand how important lifelong education is and lifelong learning. That is a sort of fundamental part of the Rice experience. Let me read you a line from our founding president, Edgar Odell Lovett. He said this in 1912. Education does not begin with the university, nor does it end in the university. It is a matter of life, the whole span of life. And thankfully, e even if you don't live in Houston, Rice can in some sense still be your intellectual home page. The School of Continuing Studies offers all kinds of courses and every subject under the sun. Uh, Dan's Traveling Owls offer interesting travel experiences all over the world. There's a, not a night at the campus that there are not lectures and concerts and presentations of all kind. And uh, most of those things that happen on campus are free. So it's, it's a wonderful place for me to have been sort of uh, introduced to the life of the mind back in 1961 but it's a place where your mind can, it helps you keep your mind engaged all the time. And I think for so many Rice students, you come here and you're, you're not quite sure what you, what you want to do in life. Maybe you think you know what you want to do in life, but you come here and you take courses and you have experiences that really transform your life and you end up changing your major. Or if you don't change your major, you take a course in Shakespeare or a music course in history of music and you discover opera or a course in you know, anything under the sun and it sort of ignites a passion that stays with you for the rest of your life, even if it doesn't shape your career. It makes your life richer and uh, deeper. Uh, sometimes it takes decades and decades for us to kind of fulfill uh, ideas or ambitions or interest that we develop when we're undergraduates or graduate students. I remember in the fall of 1964, I took a course by S.W. Higginbotham, who maybe saw you from the classes of the 60s, remember as a pretty rigorous dean of students. Uh, I never got crosswise with him in that, so I never sort of experienced the disciplinarian S.W. Higginbotham, but I took his course in Jeffersonian Jacksonian Democracy. And among the books we read was a book edited by Peden that had about 400 pages of uh, Jefferson's letters. And I, I thought Jefferson's letters were just spectacular, just fell in love with those letters. Can still remember letters I read in 1964. Then we read a fabulous book by Merrill Peterson, a historian who'd written a book that won the Bancroft Prize that was not a biography of Jefferson, but was sort of a historical analysis of what history had done with the image of Jefferson. And I thought it was just a stunning book. And I was already planning to go to graduate school, but I was so enthralled by Peterson's book, I decided to go to the University of Virginia where Merrill Peterson taught and taught about Jefferson. Now, with him was another very eminent Jeffersonian scholar, Bernard Mayo, and then the most preeminent Jefferson biographer, Dumas Malone. So I went to UVA in the fall of 1965 uh, planning to study Jefferson. But I got sidetracked. Uh, I, I guess I was a kind of a literalist 
and I went to a meeting the first day or so at graduate school, and the graduate dean said, choose this session topic quickly. Don't let, you know, time's a wasting. Now he meant during the semester or during the first year. <laughs> I thought like he meant, I thought, well, before supper, I better have a topic. <laughs> and so I had just taken a course that previous semester in primitive religion by Dr. Edward Norbeck at Rice. And we read about this really kind of weird outbreak of evangelical religion in Frontier, Kentucky, in which he said there was nothing really written about it. So I thought, well, there's my topic. Now I realize now it was kind of foolish to pick a topic the first afternoon, but uh, <laughs> I did, and that, that became a dissertation, and that became a book, and that book led to another book on a sort of a similar subject, and that book led to a book about religion in general that had a chapter on slave religion and that led to a history of slavery and you know one thing led to another and uh, 50 years later I retired at Rice from editing the Journal of Southern History but still teaching and it came to me you know 50 years ago I went to graduate school to study Jefferson and I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I mean, I've been reading about Jefferson and keeping up with him, that kind of passion that was ignited in that Rice class had never died, but I never had time to do it. I had, my career went different directions. So I decided, well, you know, if I'm ever gonna do this, I better start. So, I mean, again, I, I wasn't starting from scratch. I've been keeping up, but I wasn't fundamentally involved in it. But so, I did that. And uh, Tuesday, April the 25th, my book is being published. Uh, Fifty-two years later. And I thought, you know, this, so many people I think at Rice, they find what I call a passion. They discover an interest. It may not shape their life in a close way, but they never lose that, lose that, lose that desire. And they kind of created in them at Rice, I think, is a, an understanding that our, our goal in some sense is to pursue excellence. And that our goal is to always keep learning. And, our, and that we are to understand that we all can do different kinds of things. Now, I couldn't have had a career in uh, calculus, let's say, but I could do different kinds of things. So. I just want you to revel in the experience of being back at the Rice campus, of hearing 11 innovative minds from the mayor of a big city to a Nobel Prize winner. You're going to hear topics on everything from Machiavelli to beer making. I mean, this is a diverse experience. And uh, take advantage of it. And uh, I just want to thank you for being exemplars of what we think Rice students are and about to be, lifelong learners. So enjoy the experience. I'm finished. <laughs> For the first time in my life, I talk less than I was given. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it is a lifelong learning. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bowles. We really appreciate you being here with us this morning.